Hello everyone, welcome to this uh, new tutorial. Today we are going to cover a new topic. It's related to a series of videos that I'm going to prepare and they are related to um, introductory videos for solar physics. So today um, we are going to start learning about instrumentation, in particular learning about polarimetry and how to measure it with uh, an instrument. And the idea is that we are going to enter in detail in some topics, but other topics we just briefly are going to touch them. So I think the the audience, the main the main audience for this video, is going to be students of any level, bachelor, master, or PhD, and also people that are just starting to get into instrumentation and they want to start just learning the the basics of how we measure polarimetry in solar physics. And, and also check some real examples of how this is done. Okay, so then let's start. Uh, first is just that I want to, um, as a brief introduction, as I said, we are going to cover the basis of polarimetry, but also that uh, we are going to have additional material and also this presentation in the in the Dropbox links that you uh, and the Dropbox link that you can find in the in the presentation. So there's a document, also some references, so please, if, if you're interested, just, just go there and check it. And, and also the idea is that I'm, I'm recording this for, for YouTube, so you will be able to find the, the tutorial online. Okay, so then let's start with just briefly touching uh, the main uh, thing that we are going to um, measure with uh, our polarimeter, that is Stokes profiles or Stokes parameters. So I'm not going to enter into much detail, it's just to mention briefly that uh, we described the polarization state of light uh, using the Stokes formalism, so the Stokes parameters. In that sense, we will have four Stokes parameters, I, Q, U, and V. And just as a general reference, we can set that Stokes I refers to the unpolarized intensity. Then Stokes Q refers to um, light that is linearly polarized, for example, at zero or 90 degrees. So you can see the first um, column of this figure. Then in the case of Q is also light that is linearly polarized, but at different angles, so 45 degrees or 135 degrees. And then finally, Stokes V uh, describes the light that is uh, either left-handed or right-handed, uh, circularly polarized. So in the in the figure, just uh, take note that in this case is 100% uh, percent polarized in one of the cases. So, for example, linear polarized, fully linear polarized in zero degrees or 45 degrees, or the same for circular polarization. So this is just an usually an ideal case. And in, in normally, when we observe the light, there's always a certain amount of, uh, amount of percentage for any of the stock parameters. Okay, so then. <clears throat> why Stokes P's are uh, so? Why the Stokes parameters are important for us? Well, in this case, is that when we perform an observation of a, 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 a specific feature in in the sun, for example, in this case, is a huge sunspot, or well, a combination of them. In fact, uh, we can see that the spatial distribution of uh, reference um, features that we compute from from the Stokes profiles. They are very different and they provide information about different atmospheric parameters. So in particular, we have that the Stokes I is usually uh, the one that is most sensitive to temperature, also velocities, although in general is sensitive to, to most of the physical parameters. But when we observe, for example, this uh, spatial, so this is the spatial distribution of the continuum intensity. So we can see that there are bright areas, there are between dark and, and, and white and, and bright areas in, in this region, but they have a like a filamentary structure. And then we have very dark areas. So just seeing the spatial fluctuations of the continuum intensity, we have an idea of what type of features we have in the sun. And in this case, bright regions usually are a bit hotter and dark regions are cooler than, than the others. So just examining the, the intensity, we can get an idea of how are the thermal properties of the of the features that we are observing. And then in the case of uh, Stokes Q and U, for example, 
they both are going to provide us information of the horizontal component of the magnetic field respect to the our line of sight or respect to the to the solar surface and then in this case we have that these blue and orange patterns they have a specific pattern you can see that they are uh, similar in in this case because sunspot they tend to be uh, radial in, in a structure so they are similar but slightly shifted so when you have here dark and here dark here is a bit white and then it's darker and then it's whiter and then it's darker so they are like shifted in the sense that they still provide information of the horizontal component of the magnetic field but as we saw before they are just slightly shifted in in degrees respect one respect to the other and then in the case of stokes b uh, is going to provide us information about the magnetic field that is vertical respect to the solar surface so it's parallel to our line of sight and you can see that the structure is different uh, the spatial distribution is different than, than for q and u and this is because the the properties of the magnetic field in the sunspot they are different from the darkest areas to the let's say gray areas to the bright areas outside so just looking at the maximum polarization signals uh, from u uh, so q u and v we can get an idea of how the magnetic field is, is behaving either and uh, not only in in distribution but also in inclination and also in, in strength Okay, so then in that sense it's really crucial for us to, to measure the polarization degree of light for any feature that we are studying because it will allow us to uh, infer the, the information in terms of temperature, velocity, but also the magnetic field vector. Okay, so then how we measure uh, polarization and this is one of the key elements of this uh, presentation. The idea is that uh, we want to determine or to measure the, the four Stokes parameters, so IQ, U and V. So in that sense, uh, we want to estimate, for example, how much of the light that we are receiving is either uh, linearly polarized or circularly polarized. So the problem is that, in general, the sensors that we use are similar to the ones that we use, for example, in, in our smartphones or in our cameras. So they are sensitive to the amount of light, to the number of photons, but they are not able to distinguish if there's if those photons are either linearly polarized, circular polarized, or just unpolarized. So then here is where we have the, the main the main issue um, for measuring the, the degree of polarization, that is that our sensors are not sensitive to the polarization degree of light. So then the role of a polarimeter is essentially try to um, encode or transform that information that is contained in in the light to an information that the sensor can be sensitive to so in that sense um, we have just uh, here two examples uh, this is one example from the sunrise chromospheric infrared polarimeter that is a relatively new instrument and then this is another example from from the grease instrument that is also relatively new and in both cases uh, there are several uh, elements for the polarimeter and and we will cover them later but here is one case where this is uh, the wave plate and this is the, um, the electronics and here the polarimeter is, uh, is actually this cylinder that is behind the input or so the entrance slit of the of the instrument so so then as i was saying uh, the idea is that we are going to use a polarimeter to try to um, translate the polarization information or the information of the polarization degree of the light into something that the sensor can, can read. So let's just start first with uh, the key element for, for understanding the, the whole process, that is, let's start with the Mueller formalism. So in this case, we have that light that is coming, in this case, the four Stokes parameters from, for example, from the sun, when it passes through uh, certain optical medium uh, it will have an impact on the light it will uh, perturb the that's incoming light so when we uh, measure it uh, the output uh, light so the output stock vector will be that uh, equal to the input stocks profiles uh, multiplied by what we call the Mueller matrix of this uh, optical element so in that sense, we can represent any optical element by a Mueller matrix. 
that will uh, describe how the light that comes and passes through that element is modified by it. So in general, as we have the Stokes formalism that is a four uh, vector, uh, the, the mirror matrix will be a four by four uh, matrix. Okay. And in general, most of the elements, they have a specific uh, meaning. But for this presentation, I will just going to uh, skip it. Uh, but the idea is that if you want to get uh, to know more, just check. Um, but the important thing is that uh, we will try to, um, so we will have the chance to describe any optical element with a 4x4 four four matrix. Okay. And also the good thing of the, um, of the Miller formalism is that we can add additional uh, elements and we will just have that the output uh, light after passing through those elements is equal to the multiplication of each of, of the Muller matrix of each element. So in that sense, imagine that you have three optical elements and the light is passing through them. So we just need to multiply uh, all of them and then we will get the output um, light and the important thing is um, just be careful because the multiplication is not uh, commutative. So we cannot exchange the Muller matrix from one side to the other in the sense that we have to multiply the Muller matrix uh, times the input uh, light um, as the light passes through. So it means that in this, uh, in this equation, the first element that the light encounters is, will, it will be a one and then if there's a second element, it will be a two and the third element will be a three, but we cannot change the other. So we have to go one by one, multiplying each matrix at times the input uh, stocks parameter. OK. So then um, the idea is that, uh, again, we we are going to be sensitive only to the intensity. So it means that uh, the measurement that we are going to get is not going to be a vector, it's just going to be the first element of the output Stokes vector. And this element will be just the result of multiplying the first row of the Muller matrix times the input Stokes vector. So these are the four elements of the, of the Muller matrix, either one ele optical element or the combination of all of them. But it is that we only measure intensity, so we are only going to have the result of the first row. And as you can see, we will have one value that we measure, so uh, let's call it SI. And then we will have four unknowns, I, Q, U and B. So then in that sense, with one measurement, we are not going to be able to infer or determine the, the four stocks parameters. OK, so then the, the concept of a polarimeter is to devise a strategy where we perform different measurements with uh, an opt different optical elements. And these measurements are enough to provide a series of uh, linear uh, combination of the in uh, input stocks profiles. So then we will have a system that we can resolve and then we can get the, the information of the stocks parameters. Okay. As you probably have guessed, uh, the idea is that uh, we have four Stokes parameters. So we can make, for example, four measurements. And then if they provide independent combination of the, of the Stokes parameters, then we will have enough information to solve the, the four unknowns. Uh, but in fact, uh, there are different systems where they have uh, different measurements. So for example, in the case of the Tenerife infrared polarimeter that we are going to study in detail today, we have four measurements. So then four measurements with different com combination of the input I, Q, U and V will allow us to solve the system and to infer the, the input parameters. But there are other instruments like the advanced Stokes polarimeter or, or the Sandra's chromospheric infrared polarimeter that I mentioned before, that they use a larger amount of measurements and there are 16 in this case. So in that sense, um, let's assume that we have the um, number of measurements that will allow us to, to derive the, the input stocks parameters. So then what we have is that we, we will uh, be able to write the, the equation that defines a polarimeter 
and in this case it's uh, the we have that the input stocks parameters that is i times a matrix that is what we call modulation matrix because it comes from our um, strategy of modulating the incoming light to produce the linear combinations that are, we are, that will allow us to infer the stocks parameters and then n is the number of measurements so we do a measurement we get the first row of the Mueller matrix times the, the stocks parameters then we do a second measurement with a different combination of um, of optical elements so we will have a different combination of Mueller matrix times the input profiles and then we do this several times as we saw before it could be 4 it could be 16 so then at the end we will have a system that will be measurements equal a combination of uh, stocks profiles multiplied by the the properties of the elements that we are using for measure them, for measuring them so then m could be uh, any matrix it could be 4 by 4 but it could be a larger number and the idea is that when we have this then in order to get the input profiles uh, what we're going to do is to reverse the, the equation and we will have that this equation that says that the uh, initial uh, light so the input stocks profiles are equal to the product of the the modulation matrix this one that is just the inverse of m the modulation matrix times the measurement that we have done okay and and we are going to enter in detail, so don't don't worry about that. But the important thing is that um, the the modulation matrix or the number of elements of the measurements that we do should be a certain. Um, it should have certain properties, mainly that it should has a should have an, an inverse. So in order to compute the modulation matrix, M should be um, we should have a an inverse an invertible solution of the of the matrix. Okay. So then I think, I hope so far so good. So let's go slowly. So then just assuming that we want to determine these um, different combinations of the input profiles that will allow us to compute the modulation matrix and after that the demodulation matrix, which optical elements we can use for that. And the main ones are the retarders. So the retarders will allow us to change, to modify the polarization state of light and the idea is that they are basically defined by the angle uh, of the orientation of the fast axis this angle is usually uh, referred as z and then they will also have a retardance that is the phase shift that they will introduce between the, the ordinary and the extraordinary components of the, of the polarization so then the idea is that we know the the Müller matrix of a retarder is defined by this one don't worry it looks a bit ugly but in general we choose uh, combinations of delta and, and zeta uh, values and theta values that make this a bit easier but the important thing is that we know how a uh, retarder behaves so we know how the Mueller matrix is defined so then we can use it for computing this uh, combination of, uh, of input stocks parameters and this is for example just yes, an example is an optical device it looks like a filter and in general they have a mark and this is the mark of the, the orientation of the fax axis so you can decide how you, ori you want to orient, it, to orient it in order to produce the, the modulation um, combination that you want to use okay so then the idea is that we we have that a retarder will have an impact uh, on light but as we said we need uh, different measurements where we change the light slightly different so at least four measurements but in general we can we can have more so then the idea is how we get multiple retarders and and the idea is uh, there's multiple strategies one of them is to use a retarder but insert it in a rotating uh, platform that is what we saw at the beginning uh, i think figure one for the sunrise chromospheric infra uh, infrared polar spectropolarimeter so there the retarder is placed on a platform that is moving with time so then uh, every time that we perform the measurement it means that the um, uh, angle of the fax axis is changing and then it means that we just we can rotate it several times so then we will produce this um, number of 
uh, independent linear combinations of, of the input stocks parameters. A uh, second option is the use of liquid crystals. They are special uh, optical devices where they are retarders and they have an orientation of the fast axis. But then when we apply an external voltage to the element, the orientation of the fast axis can be changed. It's just one, but it can be changed. So then it means that one uh, liquid crystal can have it can behave like a two retarders so one with the orientation of zeta and then the second orientation of delta zeta that is the one that we get when we apply the standard voltage so then in that sense if we have two uh, liquid crystals and each one produces two combinations so then the combination of the two will be four and this is the the minimum required for solving the the system uh, that we, we mentioned before. So in general, um, polarimeters that use uh, liquid crystals, they can use just two to produce the four uh, independent combi combination of the input stocks parameters. Uh, this is, for example, one case of the, of the instrument that we are going to examine in, in, uh, in detail today. And this is just one of the liquid crystals that are used in, in the Tenerife infrared polarimeter. And it doesn't look very special, but the important thing is that it's an optical element. And as you see, there's a wire connected to it. And this is the wire that we apply the, the voltage. So the, the fast axis will change its orientation uh, uh, from zeta to delta zeta. Okay. And then uh, there's also the option of uh, two retarders with uh, selective fixed orientation. In this case, they don't need to rotate uh, completely so they just maybe can uh, use two positions and then combine with another two positions they will have an, again the, the four combinations um, also there are another uh, modulators or, or, uh, or elements that are uh, piezoelastic or piezoelectric uh, modulators and i think they are similar to liquid crystal so in this case i think it's pressure what is applied to change the orientation of the fast axis but the key the key thing here is that they are extremely fast. So in principle, they can change the orientation in a very uh, fast frequencies. And this could be very interesting if you are going to perform measurements that are at the limit of the of the sensor technology. So they go as fast as possible. But in, in summary, the four combinations or, or additional ones, if you find in the literature, they just want to produce the minimum number of uh, linearly independent combination of the Stokes parameters so then we can solve the, the modulation uh, equation and then uh, compute the, the modulation matrix okay so then the next step is that in general uh, we have that uh, modulators or the retarders that we we mentioned before they will uh, modify the 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 polarization degree of light so they will produce a shift on on the on the plane of polarization in order to produce this combination so they will just modify the the input uh, light but the problem is that uh, in general if you go back to the um, uh, matrix of the the Müller matrix of the retarder you will see that the first row is one zero 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 so it means that a retarder will in fact change the the polarization uh, degree of, of the light so that we can produce these combinations but the problem is that just a retarder will produce those changes in the uh, q u and v parameters so the output q u and v parameters they will definitely be different but as the first row is one zero 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 it means that the output intensity will be the same intensity as the input so we are not really seeing with, an, with a traditional sensor, the changes that we are making. So for that, we need to project those changes on the intensity that we measure. And for that, we use an analyzer, okay? An analyzer is usually a linear polarizer or a polarization beam splitter. In both cases, they, they, they do the same. The only difference is that the polarization beam splitter, uh, that, like, the, like the one you see in the figure, the light is coming and then internally it's separating the the light into the two orthogonal uh, polarization states so then we will have two output beams uh, with orthogonal polarization and uh, the goal of of this process is that first 
the two beams when they arrive to the sensor they can be some so they will use twice the space in the sensor but if if you have the possibility of doing it then we can sum them and then we will increase the, the signal to noise ratio because we are just adding a valuable signal but also as they are they should have the same properties if we subtract them and there's some signal it means that we have some residual error or some spurious polarization due to different elements in the in the either in the polarimeter in the telescope or in the for example in the solar atmosphere so then the idea is that polarimeters with a, a dual beam or a beam splitter uh, uh, so analyzer as, as a polarization beam splitter they usually are able to to reach better signal to noise ratio and probably get a better um, polarization accuracy when when we are doing the the data reduction okay so i think i'm going a bit fast but i hope you are following me so let's start with a real example okay and this is the tenerife infrared polarimeter that i have mentioned a bit uh, it was developed initially in the 90s and it was installed in the uh, BTT, the Vacuum um, Tower Telescope in the Tenerife Observatory, in the instrument tip. Uh, but then it was moved to, to the Gregor Infrared Spectrograph that is now installed in the, in the Gregor Telescope. And the, the system is, uh, is the same and the, and the theory behind it is the same. So uh, we are going to learn uh, the details, or at least the theoretical uh, details of the of an instrument that was used and is still uh, be used in, in solar physics okay so in this case is one of the simplest ones because it's just two liquid crystals uh, and they, they are uh, so they are different type of liquid crystals in this case are ferroelectric they are um, I think one of the advantages of ferroelectric versus different uh, liquid crystals is that this one uh, they change the the, the orientation of the fax axis in in the order of microseconds so it's they are really fast so they can modulate the, the light very fast and this one also has an analyzer that is a polarization beam split okay so then in that sense uh, the first liquid crystal has a retardance a theoretical retardance of 180 degrees so this is the delta value for this um, 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 uh, liquid crystal so for the one we use in the in the Mueller matrix and then the second one it has a, a retardance of 90 degrees okay in this in, in general this is what we people call um, lambda half and lambda quarter and but this is just a theoretical values okay we, I will explain later what what this means um, and in both cases we are going to assume that the change of a fast axis when we apply the voltage is 45 degrees so it means that imagine that one is at zero when we apply the, the the voltage it will go to 45 okay so in that sense uh, the modulation scheme should be um, four combinations of Mueller matrices and each Mueller matrix will be the result of the following product so it will be uh, the product of the, the first liquid crystal that it will be the one with 180 degrees and then uh, it will have um, a set of um, orientations that I will cover later. Then this will be multiplied by the second liquid crystal that will have the, the retardance of 90 degrees. And then this will be multiplied by the Miller matrix of analyzer. Okay. So then in that sense, uh, we will have that the theoretical, uh, so the modulation scheme for the for the Tenerife infrared polarimeter is the following one. So the first liquid crystal will be at position zero and the second one will be at minus 22.5. So then we apply the voltage in the, in the first crystal and we change it while the second crystal remains the same. Then we go back to zero and then we change the, the we apply the voltage in the second liquid crystal and then we apply the voltage in the, in the other uh, liquid crystal. So at the end, we have two combinations times two, so we will have four combinations. And the idea is that now we are going to compute each of those products for these four combinations, including the retardant values that we have above, so 180 and 90 degrees. Okay, so let's go step by step. And the idea is uh, we start with the first case, 
So then in this case, we are going to multiply the leaked crystal with uh, orientation zero and, and uh, 180 degrees, minus 22.5 and 90 degrees. And then we multiply by the matrix of the linear polarizer. Uh, as, as, as I mentioned before, the link to downloading the material with all the matrix and, and everything, it's uh, in, in the Dropbox link. So if you want to follow this step by step and doing it by yourself, you will have there all the information. And then after some algebra, we get that this is the, the first Müller matrix that, that we get for the first modulation state, okay? so for, for the combination of the two liquid crystals. So this is uh, measurement one. Then measurement two will be the same, just in this case, we are changing the orientation of the fast axis of the first liquid crystal. So we do the operation and we get another uh, Muller matrix, okay? Now let's do the same for the third case. So in this case, this one goes back to zero and then this one moves from minus 22.5 to plus 22.5. So we do the product and we get another Muller matrix and then in the fourth case, uh, this one moves to 45. This one has moved from minus 20 to 22.5. So we have the final fourth configuration. And then we will get another Miller matrix. Okay. So you can you can do this at home. And, and if you have uh, any issues, just let me know or, or check the document that I mentioned. Okay. So then um, now we have the four Miller matrices that we will have for the four different measurements. So then we can compute the modulation matrix. And as I said before, so we have a measurement that will be the result of multiplying the first row times the Stokes profiles. Then uh, the second measurement will be the first row times the second, uh, so times, times the Stokes profiles. The third measurement will be the first row again of the new mirror matrix times the Stokes profiles. So then the mirror matrix is essentially just the first row of all the different measurements that we are um, making. So then if you go back uh, and you can check uh, the first row of all the Muller matrix that I uh, computed, they correspond to the these four uh, rows that we have here. Okay. So then in that sense, again, this is the simplest case where we only have four uh, measurements. So then uh, the, the modulation matrix is a four by four array. And then we can compute something that is very important for estimating how well designed is a, a polarimeter and, and, and how well recovered are the input stocks parameters is to compute the efficiencies. And in this case, um, we have that D is the demodulation matrix. So if we solve this equation, particular attention is that I put it four here and four here, but this is actually N. So in this case, n is equal to 4. But if you have a scheme that has a larger n, just be aware that this is uh, n and n, and, and and then use the normal, the, the correct uh, multiplication factor. You please also check the details in the in the mentioned reference. So then the idea is that if you are following this and and you can you can try to compute the inverse of this array, and then solve this equation, and in principle you should get these values. Okay, I think it's a good exercise. At least I like to do some algebra. So if you have time, just try it and, and check it and let me know if there are some, some error in my computation. But if everything goes well and went well, the idea is that this result is indicating that we have um, a theoretical efficiency when determining or inferring stocks V of 70% and then 50% for Q and U. Okay. So this is basically the whole uh, Tenerife infrared polarimeter uh, since the, the physical element, so two liquid crystals times a polarization beam splitter, the modulation scheme, the modulation matrix, the theoretical one, and then the efficiency. So we have already described uh, the whole polarimeter in, in three slides. Okay, so then Let's go one one last slide, and I think this is important because I I've, I've been mentioning theoretical several times, and this is because um, the main issue is that retarders they have uh, as as we said uh, delta that is the the retardance that defines the, the retarder itself, but the problem is that uh, this retarder retardance it's 
wavelength dependent. So in the sense that the values that we set 180 and 90 degrees, for example, in this case are just uh, where we have one. So this vertical line. And then as we move from there, the retardance is different. So if delta is different, then the Miller matrix are different. And then the modulation matrix will be different. And then eventually the efficiencies will be also different. And this is critical because if the the properties of the of the uh, liquid crystals or the or the modulators they change drastically it can mean that the efficiency at a certain wavelength is so low that we cannot trust it for for polarization measurements so then in that sense um, we should be careful that uh, our retarders behave well in the wavelength region that we want to observe and if for any reason the wavelength regions are so far that the retardants don't behave well, then we probably just need uh, two uh, different polarimeters or at least two set of, of retardants. This is, for example, what is uh, is used in, in TIP. So the, the instrument works at 1 micron and 1.5 micron, and this is so far that uh, the system always uses two sets of uh, retardants one optimized for one micron and the other optimized for 1.5 micron. Okay, so then another thing that is important to mention, at least briefly, because this is a really um, uh, interesting uh, topic, but really, really, um, uh, let's say a bit complex. But the idea is that um, we are performing measurements. So then between one measurement and the other, there is some time the difference. And, and this time, it, it can be relatively long in comparison with the um, life cycle of other things that are happening when we are performing the measurement. So then in that sense, uh, for example, if the integration time is too long and, for example, the atmosphere is changing too much, we can have that the changes produced by the atmosphere between one measurement and the other can induce um, errors when inferring the, the Stokes parameters. And these are relatively difficult or almost impossible to to really eliminate. So then uh, there are also the deviations from the theoretical case in efficiency just because the time needed for performing different measurements uh, can be long in comparison with the different effects that can happen when we are performing these measurements. So this is just as a let's say touch it in the sense that we have determined the theoretical one but the real one is different and also the telescope uh, is um, in front of the polarimeter so when you compare the efficiencies of your polarimeter theoretical ones and the um, observed ones you can also have differences because you are just measuring the theoretical uh, scheme of your uh, instrument but the telescope also uh, can induce some some effect on on your polarization accuracy. So in general, I think this was more or less what I wanted to say. Um, I think this is, I, I think it's complete in the sense that it covers a lot of um, things, but again, it's also relatively basic because I didn't want to really enter in, in details in many, many areas, but I, I hope it is still complete. Um, and this is what I mentioned. And then um, I hope you follow it. I, I It's a really complicated topic, so I, I think I was maybe not so clear in some areas, but still, if you have any questions, just let me know and I will be glad to, to answer them. So just thanks for your attention and I will just leave you with the references and I hope to see you in the next one. Bye.